Good morning, everybody. I'm inventing a new word. It's called spinter. It's spring and winter combined with the, what we got here. It's uh, quite a time of the year of change, isn't it? Well, good morning, and thank you all for uh, coming here today. And I appreciate you uh, making an adjustment in the schedule. We wanted to make sure that we uh, uh, had the USCCB <coughs> press conference uh, uh, finish, conclude before uh, we came together. I have an opening statement, and I, I will be happy to take your questions. Uh, this morning, Pope Francis released Amoris Laetitia, The Joy of Love, following the two recent synods of bishops on marriage and family life. I welcome this document, having attended the 2015 synod, where the issues the Pope addresses here uh, were discussed. Uh, the title comes from the first sentence of the document, which reads, the joy of love experienced by families is also the joy of the church. And the message is clear. Family life is a gift. And the more we treasure and support it, the truer we are to ourselves as believers. The Holy Father says some things that might surprise you. He is complimentary about the women's movement and tells us that we can learn from Eastern Rite married priests. His language is sometimes very colorful and highly expressive. He warns us not to, quote, simply apply moral laws to those living in, quote, unquote, irregular situations, as if they were stones to throw at people's lives. Aside from this, my first impression is that this very readable text reveals a true pastor, someone who has honed a pastoral sensitivity as a priest for more than half a century. His writing style is crisp and fresh, making the text easily accessible. He holds the reader's attention through the use of imaginative references that range from the Danish film Babette's Feast to a sermon by Martin Luther King, which urges us to see a good in every person, even those who hate us. At the same time, he demonstrates his close, closeness to the real lives of people, someone who knows the smell of the sheep, as he takes up a wide spectrum of the complexity that defines family living in our time. Virtually no challenge is ignored. Marriage preparation, proper training of future priests, adoption, family prayer, sex education, the dignity of women, children's rights, you name it. Indeed, it is his candor and his honesty that I find so very engaging. For instance, he says that a healthy dose of self-criticism is in order for us pastors in the way that we treat people and the way that we present the church's teaching. Too often, he says, we speak in a way that is far too abstract, presenting an almost artificial theological ideal of marriage far removed from the concrete situations and the practical possibilities of real families. Two words are worth emphasizing as important in this text. The first is discernment. The second is integration. Describing marriage as a journey, a dynamic path to personal development and fulfillment, Pope Francis speaks of the importance of discernment in those situations in which we fall short of what the Lord asks of us. With profound respect for people, the church has to, quote, make room for the consciences of, faith, of the faithful, who very often respond as best they can to the gospel amid their limitations and are capable of carrying out their own discernment in complex situations. We have been called, he reminds pastors, to form consciences, not to replace them. There are no easy recipes. And it is impossible to provide a new set of general rules, canonical in nature and applicable to all cases. Rather, he urges, quote, a responsible personal and pastoral discernment of particular cases by priests who have the duty to accompany the divorced and remarried in helping them to understand their situation according to the teachings of the church and the guidelines of the bishop. Regardless, it can no longer simply be said, according to Pope Francis, 
that all those in a quote-unquote irregular situation are living in a state of mortal sin and are deprived of sanctifying grace. The church's pastors, in proposing to the faithful the full ideal of the gospel and the church teaching, must also help them to treat the weak with compassion, avoiding aggravation or unduly harsh and hasty judgments. The gospel itself tells us, he says, not to judge, not to condemn. On the contrary, discernment also has to be about identifying and upholding those many positive elements that are part of a person's life, even if they are falling short of the ideal. Because it is in the struggles, in the imperfect, in the in-betweens in life that God calls us and graces us. We as pastors must meet people there, for Jesus expects us to stop looking for those personal and communal niches which shelter us from the maelstrom of human misfortune and instead to enter into the reality of other people's lives and to know the power of tenderness. Whenever we do that, our lives become wonderfully complicated, he says. And yet, as pastors accompany people who because of their, li their lives fall short of the ideal, the goal has to be integration into church life. No one can be condemned forever, he says. That is not the logic of the gospel. The goal of accompanying people is to help each person find his or her proper way of participating in the ecclesial community and thus to experience being touched by an unmerited, unconditional, and gratuitous mercy. And he is not speaking here only of the divorced and remarried, but of everyone in whatever situation they find themselves. There are no changes in doctrine in this document. And in fact, the Pope urges the church not to step away from proposing the full ideal of marriage. At the same time, he makes clear that doctrines are at the service of the pastoral mission. He also knows that this call for a more compassionate pastoral outreach of accompaniment, discernment, and integration, one marked by tenderness, will leave some perplexed. This is what he says. I understand those who prefer a more rigorous pastoral care which leaves no room for confusion. But I sincerely believe that Jesus wants a church attentive to the goodness which the Holy Spirit sows in the midst of human weakness. A mother who, while clearly expressing her objective teaching, always does what good she can, even if in the process her shoes get soiled in the mud of the street. Thank you. I'm happy now to take your questions. Please. Russell, oh. from ABC 7. Yes. Uh, so uh, in, in the document, uh, some have said that it actually echoes your own comments regarding uh, outreach to gays. Uh, it, it, the Pope says that, that we should respectfully receive, uh, gay people should respectfully receive assistance to care of God's will in their lives. What concrete uh, outreach advice, I guess, does this provide, and how will it affect the way you uh, tell your priests to reach out to gay Catholics? Well, in fact, I would ask them to make sure that they reach out to all uh, people, all Catholics, uh, regardless of their sexual orientation or the circumstances that they find in life. There are a lot of people who are struggling and who uh, have uh, an impulse to belong to the church and to participate in the life of the church. And our job is to actively reach out. It's not a matter of just sitting by and letting them come to us. So uh, I have had, for instance, discussions with divorced and remarried people since I've been here, uh, gay uh, people as well. Uh, to get to know uh, their lives. And I have found that those conversations uh, are really great starting points uh, for then having them being accompanied as individuals. Uh, I think that that's what the Pope is asking us to do here. Uh, and, and the Pope has made clear that the whole uh, role of formation of consciences and not replacing them is, in fact, for all Catholics, not just for people who are in situations of being divorced and remarried. Uh, I think that's a very liberating part of the document because what, what we see here is that the Pope really is calling us to an adult spirituality. Yes? Stefano Esposito with the Chicago Sun Times. What do you say to more traditional Catholics who see this as kind of a, a slippery slope? Uh, change? 
significant change in what, if not? Well, I think it's a significant development. I think that uh, it is uh, not a slippery slope, but a pathway forward for people who uh, uh, have otherwise found themselves stuck. Uh, and I have found that, by and large, Catholics uh, across the spectrum, however they identify themselves as liberal or conservative, uh, really live day to day with family members who uh, are uh, falling short, as they would say, of the ideal. We all fall short to some degree. But they want to make sure that they're included. They're having these kinds of discussions in their own family already about uh, who do you invite to dinner and how do you uh, 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 keep people within the family. This is, this is a family issue for the church as well. Please. I'm Church Minister, and my Martinez City is too. Just in reading the Pope's words, what surprised you or impressed you the most about the Pope's words? Well, I guess I, I really am not totally surprised in the sense that his other writings have clearly shown a direction uh, that would uh, uh, result in what we have. And also during the Synod, I saw this as well. That's why somebody asked a question about whether or not my remarks during the Synod in the interview that I gave were in some way uh, in tune with, uh, with what we have in this document. And I would say, yes, that's the case. Uh, so I think that. Uh, I think that uh, what, what is always surprising to me about this uh, Pope of Surprises is um, his ability to craft language in a very convincing way. Uh, and he draws on such a rich heritage of literature and uh, people uh, who are different to, uh, apart from the, uh, the Catholic Church, like Martin Luther King and so on. Um, and I think that his ability to uh, really be sensitive to the human situation in life continues to amazes me. Uh, he amazes me. He's got, he's got an intuition about where people uh, live their actual lives. He's not living in a bubble. Uh, he doesn't want to idealize marriage. He realized that marriage uh, in the concrete, uh, family in the concrete, has its struggles, but we should not be afraid of entering there because that's precisely where God's grace happens. Please. Well, I wouldn't exclude anyone. I would think that we, I want to, would like to have. I would like our pastors to have discussions with all of those folks who are in difficult in these kinds of situations. But he does uh, touch upon a couple of instances. For instance, those people who have been abandoned by one spouse and now are caring for children in a second marriage. That there is something good that's happening in that marriage that has to be recognized and upheld and supported. Uh, we know those those situations all the time. Uh, also, we know where uh, there are situations in which people uh, have become married um, very young uh, without due discretion on their part, and then the marriage breaks up, and then they feel alienated from the church. Already, the Pope has allowed for what what he calls the uh, the shorter process, uh, the process of braviar, purchases braviar, uh, in terms of annulments, and I've already exercised. Uh, those uh, 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 protocols in the archdiocese uh, with regard to some uh, marriage cases. Sure. There, there are Catholics who think right. that maybe Ted Kennedy can hire a canonical lawyer and get right. things straightened out, but for them it's impossible. Well, you know, and I, I don't know the case in, in that particular uh, uh, instance, but I do know my experience as a pastor over these 41 years is that there is no you, you've seen a marriage and you've seen one marriage. And there is no situation that can be replicated. Every instance has its own variables that are part of it. And so what the Pope is saying is get to know the situation here. And that's, I think, what this document is trying to encourage. Yolanda Perdomo with WBEZ. You mentioned that there were lessons learned from the women's movement, even though there were no laws that were changed from this document. Right. Do you foresee um, a path that women could be pastors? Well, I think that there is uh, uh, an enormous uh, 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 role for women in leadership positions within the Catholic Church. Uh, I think that if you just look at the um, uh, look at the pastoral center here at Quigley, you will see that uh, 
I, I have surrounded myself with all sorts of competent women in high-level places, uh, and, and I think that that's important. There is a possibility, in fact, women do serve in different administrative roles in parishes as administrators throughout the world and throughout different parts of the United States as well. So I, I think that uh, there, there surely is a role for women in leadership positions within the church, and I've always tried to encourage that. A, as, as people leading as priest yes. as ordained priest yes. no that, that's he doesn't touch upon that at all and that's not what this document is yes Samir Puskar with NBC News um, the Pope is urging a more merciful approach to what he calls wounded families um, but when they go to their parish priests they're often met with judgment and not mercy uh, how can you ensure that all priests offer mercy and compassion well First of all, I have great regard for the priests here in Chicago. I'm impressed in the 18 months that I have been here with their pastoral sensitivity. But I think in a concrete way, what we're going to be doing is I'm going to be taking this document, and the Pope asks us to make sure we don't rush through it, and study it with my lay and, um, and ordained advisors, my councils, and say, what concretely do we have to do? Uh, do we need to form maybe teams that are going to help uh, pastors reach out to people? Do we need to uh, uh, look for ways in which we're going to uh, enhance our marriage preparation program that also uh, overlaps into the first years of uh, the marriage to support a young couple? Uh, is there a program that we can put together in the church that helps uh, families who welcome that first child into the world? So I think that this has so many possibilities for us uh, that should uh, spark our imagination. Yes. Archbishop uh, Kai Martin with NBC Chicago. Just um, this question is about local parishes. Right. Some are struggling as Pilsen, St. Albert's had a $3 million donation, but they said it still may not be enough. And I know your research. Can I correct that though? It really wasn't a $3 million donation. Okay, okay. okay. it so was one point, what was it? 1.6, uh-huh. On the condition the that it would be used for uh, this. Okay. Can you address concerns in the Pilsen community of the restructuring of parishes? There? I'd be happy to do that, but this is not what this news conference is oh, about. You don't get a chance to okay. Office. But I can talk to you later about okay. that. But I'd like to take the questions on this document. Okay. Nancy Liu with WGN News. The flip side to the earlier question, what do you have to say to people who wanted a change in doctrine, people who have left the church? Do you really think they'll come back just with a welcoming attitude? Well, I think that uh, there is a uh, there is an approach here that, in fact, doesn't require any change in doctrine because the doctrine of the church has always been one of mercy and compassion, and the Pope is recovering that in a much stronger and forceful way. So I think that it is uh, it is part of the the doctrine of the church to reach out with compassion to people, and uh, that's where the Pope, I think, is uh, making a great contribution. He's recovering something that perhaps we may have lost sight of. Yeah. Hi, Mary Cotterer with Relevant Radio. In the beginning of this document, our Holy Father states to read it slowly and not to um, come to sharp conclusions. And then you said how refreshing it was and, and crisp the verbiage. So what advice do you have for our listeners at Relevant Radio on how to process and internalize what our Holy Father is saying but on an individual level? Well, I think, first of all, the document's easily, uh, easily accessible. It's a very readable piece. So I would say take pieces of it, uh, parts of it. It's chapter by chapter. And to think about it, maybe even to talk about it with family members. Uh, I would suspect that there are going to be parishes that will have discussion groups in order for this to happen. So this is an unfolding, I think, of a very important uh, uh, enterprise within the church that's going to go forward and shape some of the discussions that we have about marriage and family life. Please. Uh, so this document, like many of uh, uh, Francis's most doc most important documents, um, might be disappointing to those who uh, would like to see him go further, and those um, and to those who we, as we've seen um, some reactions, don't want to see the waters muddled. Um, what is the Holy Father trying to do here? Well, I think that uh, I think that by and large. Uh, uh, the average Catholic is going to find that what the Pope is saying here uh, is uh, very arresting and new and creative and imaginative. That there, he is saying things they haven't heard before with regard to the church. So, uh, for instance, the, the fact that 
uh, individuals in, in shaping their conscience take responsibility and nobody can come in and in some way try to replace that conscience. Uh, he talks about the, uh, the need for families to be tolerant with each other in situations where people's lives are not perfect uh, so that we don't, uh, we don't uh, separate ourselves and judge. Uh, so I think that the average Catholic is going to find a lot in this document that is going to be encourage them. Uh, encourage them. So it's, and it is not about, this is not about a reform of rules. It's about reform of the church. That, that, this is what this is about. It's not just a matter of changing some rules. It's about having a, a, a very radical change in the approach that we have to people who live everyday lives and struggle uh, to be faithful to the gospel and accompany and integrate them. So I think that that's, that's, the, uh, that's the important message. Is there any part of it that you find either ambiguous or where you might differ slightly? Um, I would say no. I mean, I, I'm, I'm surprised that it has uh, such a breadth of issues that it addresses, and um, uh, I, I think that it's faithful to what the bishops uh, who were at the Synod voted on by two-thirds. Uh, we voted on the final document, which all the articles passed by two-thirds, and I think the Pope has done this and, and moved it up a notch. Uh, so uh, I would say that it is truly representative. This is an authoritative teaching document. This is not just something the Pope does on his own. This is a result of a bishop's meeting after wide consultation with the faithful in the church over a three-year period, after two synods approving two documents by two-thirds votes, and then this is a result of it. So this, this, has, a fair, this has a very high authority uh, level to it. Well, I think that uh, you know the important. It's it's a very complex issue with regard to people's attendance uh, to, uh, to mass. Uh, it's uh, we're living in, in a society in which we, people have a lot more options and free time. And it's not that people are ill willed. It's just that uh, they really are balancing sometimes schedules. And uh, also, th there are people, no doubt, who are alienated for one reason or another. Our whole program for Renew My Church that we're doing is about revitalizing our parish so that they're properly resourced. And that's what really we want, to, we want to do. We want to make sure that our parishes are properly resourced rather than just uh, uh, having a, uh, uh, a, uh, an operation by which we uh, just pour money into situations to maintain them. We really want to be about mission and not just maintenance. Right. And they lift that alienation away. Surely you would think that the purpose is to bring those people who've been alienated back into the well, no, I, I don't think that the Pope wants to make this a self-referential uh, enterprise by which we're going to do it just so we can increase market share. That's not what this is about. Uh, he really cares about people. Uh, he, he wants to make sure that they are, uh, they are served well by the church. And it's, so it's not about uh, doing this so that we increase their attendance at Mass, uh, but that we really accompany them and integrate them and let them know that they're not alone and that the Church uh, shares the joy of their family. Yeah. Is there some concern that, that your approach to this may be different than in Milwaukee or in Joliet or wherever because the document doesn't necessarily lay out um, specifics exactly on, and, and leaves a lot of room for interpretation by bishops? Well, I think that uh, the Pope constantly has said that he wants uh, to decentralize the church in the sense that local churches have to take responsibility for their pastoral mission. And uh, we, we see that he recognizes as well that there are going to be cultural differences around the world. And so there will be different uh, responses to this document given those circumstances. So I, um, I have the pastoral care of the people within the two counties, uh, Lake and Cook County, and uh, with the, my collaborator bishops and the priests and the lay people who are a part of what, and so we will be doing what we can. We will do it in a way that's in union with the Universal Church, and I know that the Bishops' Conference in Washington uh, will also be reflecting on this document. Yeah, uh, right here. You didn't have a chance yet. Good morning, Justin Madden, Reuters. Archbishop, speaking about the human condition and human situations, um, in Illinois, with the uh, budget issues and social issues, especially with the charities and the Catholic Church, I was wondering your thoughts on that and how um, mm -hmm. um, that can be cured. 
Yeah. Well, I, again, I think I want to make sure that we, let's hear everybody's questions on this document, and I, I will come back to the two questions that were outside of this, because uh, I want to get to that. Yes? Again, to, to clarify, you, you described this as a dramatic change and an authoritative teaching document. Um, your own personal response to it, uh, informed by your role leading this archdiocese, in, in layman's terms, what's the biggest change that you see here? And, well, and, 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 and in, in a way that will affect the day-to-day -day lives of families. I would say that it's too early to tell because I want to make sure, I've always tried to make major decisions in terms of policy and procedure changes by consulting widely. I, I, I have learned that when I don't do that, I mess up. Uh, and I have, when I get a lot of smart people around me to help me, they, uh, they pull me back from the edge. And uh, I, that's what I, I really appreciate. So uh, I will in time be able to speak more intelligently to that question. Yes. Um, how challenging is it to make sure all priests are on the same page, page and do you expect any resistance on um, this uh, emphasis on compassion and mercy? I can't imagine that anybody who got into the priesthood would have difficulty with mercy and compassion. Gay marriage is legal in this country. Mm -hmm. um, there are gay families. How can they be accepted in the church mm -hmm. if the church cannot accept these families through these sacraments and rituals? The, the, um, the Pope uh, touches on the issue of people with uh, same-sex attractions in paragraphs 250 and 251, so I would refer you to that. And he starts off by indicating that we want to make clear that we have nothing but the deepest respect for people, all people, no matter their sexual orientation. And he recognizes as well that there are uh, those uh, unions uh, that have been uh, recognized by governments. Uh, all he is saying is that while he knows they exist, and he, he, he's not saying that there's not anything that's happening, that there's not some good within their own relationships, uh, there, because he does see that there's good in all of human life and human families, he doesn't think that he, he does, it is not the position of the church to put that on the same plane as a marriage between a man and a woman. And, and the church's position on that is really very, has been very clear. Uh, it, it is because uh, there is the uh, understanding of church that uh, goes from the, the story of creation until now uh, that uh, talks about the continuation of the human race and uh, is, is uh, that fruitfulness of a, of a couple, man and woman, who bring children into the world. It's not the same thing. P there are unions, no doubt, that people have, but all he is saying is not, it's not on the same plane. Yeah. We only have time for one or two more. Okay, that, get, get, go ahead. Okay, thank you. And then I want to get to these other two real quickly. Um, one word that has come up several times is conscience, and I think the Holy right. Father spoke about it in you as well. And so I was wondering what words of advice you have for our listeners at Raul Radio on how they can examine their own conscience before they even begin reading this to kind of you know rectify their intention. Are they looking for a certain answer, or how can they look at this prayerfully? So what should we ask ourselves when approach document so it can be looked at both practically and supernaturally. Well, the Pope is very clear that in this document he is setting forth what the teaching of the church is on marriage and family life. So I think it's the conscience is always benefiting from the, the light of the gospel. So I would tell them to make sure that they clearly understand what the Pope is saying about marriage and family life. But to realize as well that the, the, the struggle that we all have to living an authentic life a life by which we examine our conscience is something that uh, should uh, be the task of everybody. But it's also somewhat natural. We're all given a conscience. We, we all know when we're cheating somebody, when we're lying, when we are uh, uh, going in a direction that we, we might not want to, we might tend toward the temptation, but there is a voice within each one of us that knows. And so the Pope is saying, let's pay attention to that voice and cultivate it, but with the light of the gospel and the light of the truth. So I want to take these other two questions here that you had. Sí, en un poquito. Sí, sí. Sí, en español. En cuanto a este documento. Sí, después. Puedo después. Sí, gracias. So you had a question about the the budget. 
Yes. Okay. So how is it impacting the cafeterias here in Chicago and the against uh, over our state? Right. So what if you have to speak to the governor or right. the manager? Well, it is a, uh, there, there are ongoing conversations that uh, we're having uh, with people uh, down in Springfield about the situation that we have, not only uh, with uh, Catholic charities, but also with the university students who uh, are not uh, receiving uh, the funding that has, uh, has ordinarily been there for them. So uh, those discussions continue to be there. We're, we're hopeful. Uh, that uh, people will work together, and um, I, I would I would prefer to keep those conversations uh, private at this point. Uh, but we have been very clear about what the ramifications of no funding uh, are for uh, for Catholic charities, but also for our universities and hospitals. You had a question here. Oh, I just wanted to know if you could address for folks in Pilsen the restructuring of some parishes there mm -hmm. without throwing out specific. Sure. so they can think about what might be coming down the pipeline for the immediate future. Well, I think that you have to realize that it's been a year and a half of a process by which all of the partners, all of the parishes were uh, involved in a, in a discussion about what, how the footprint of the church should look in Pilsen, the Pilsen parishes, there are six parishes there. They had to look at how are they gonna have vibrant communities uh, that are sustainable with the population that they have. They then came to uh, uh, a discussion about that and looked at all the factors. I looked at the recommendations that were there, and it was clear that there was no way it could continue if the nearly five or six million dollars, whatever it's going to take to repair, but then also to sustain uh, the operations of St. Adelbert's Parish would be a part of the mix. So there, there was no, no way that, that could happen. And it really wasn't about money either, it was about personnel, because we don't have the priests to be able to staff all of these places. So uh, we have made it very clear that as we move forward uh, with the Renew My Church uh, program, that we're going to look at a whole host of issues. But our goal is to, how are we going to have sustainable parishes that are life-giving? Uh, we're not just about putting money in places to keep buildings up. That's a misuse of people's generosity, and it's a misuse, I think, of, uh, of, of leadership uh, when, in fact, uh, we, we realize that uh, uh, we're not taking up the mission, we're only doing maintenance. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yes, I, I would say that the article's been clear. I think both the Sun-Times and Crane did a, did a piece. I think there was one major correction we wanted to make sure is that there, there is no, uh, there was a re reference to insurance. Uh, that's just a uh, use of a term, that, but there is no insurance. We're, we have to self-fund that. So I, we just want to make sure that that was clear. I think that clarification was sent over to the media, uh, to the two newspapers that uh, dealt with it. Uh, Yes, we, we have a situation in which we're trying to deal with the, uh, 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 with the uh, realities that we have. We're trying to reach out to uh, people who uh, uh, have been uh, uh, harmed, uh, who have been victimized, uh, and we're, we've done that uh, for a number of years now, and um, that, that's ongoing. Uh, but at the same time, we have to go on with the day-to-day -day operations of the archdiocese. Um, it does have an impact on our ability uh, to do all that we would like to do, uh, but we, at this point in time, have to balance all of that just like any family does whenever there is a financial crisis and a financial moment in their, in their, uh, in their history. Uh, we're going to do the best we can, uh, and we're going to be forthright and honest about it. Thank you all.